He was randomly stopped by a reporter outside a political debate and asked to explain who he was supporting for the presidency and why. Musician Derek Ashong's answer was so impressive that the video was posted on YouTube and at last count has well over 700,000 hits. We'll talk to Derek about his music and his message. Though he and his band are now based in California, Derek has ties to Boston. Here's reporter producer Sangeeta Lee. Can one man's music change a continent? That's the mission of 32-year-old Derek Ashong. Beautiful. This producer, arranger, composer, manager, and vocalist is a mogul on the rise, busy recording his second CD with the band he founded in 2003. Our band is called Solfege, and it's a 12-piece band that fuses elements of West African high life, hip-hop, and reggae. The key people are Kelly Johnson, who's a vocalist, Jonathan Gramling, who's also a vocalist, and Malika Gramling, Jonathan's wife, who's also a vocalist, and myself. We kind of run it. Solfege has recorded at Little Dog Studios in Malden. Until recently, Ashong's management and production company was headquartered in Harvard Square. But his life and work have roots all over the world. A Harvard graduate, Ashong is a New York native by way of Ghana. The aim of his music, he says, is to uplift young people in Africa and the African diaspora. When I look on TV, I see stories of my homelands and it's like death, destruction, warfare, violence, the worst things on the planet. But when I go home, I see a lot more than that. And I want others to have a window into what I see. Ashong has an international network of filmmakers and musicians who spread the solfege sound and message. Their music videos are seen in 50 countries. Sound and image will influence your action. So in African traditions, music has typically been something that goes beyond entertainment. It's part of the oral tradition that teaches us who we are and what we stand for. Ashong is a critic of the violent language and imagery in mainstream hip-hop and rap culture. So we don't want to fight the artists. We want to say to you, hey, we understand that you represent poor people. We understand that you want to sing a song for the oppressed. Yo, why don't you come with us and do a song for Mama Africa? Bring all your flavor, all your vibes, your energy, your fire to something that we can all believe in. That fire and energy extends to SMT, the Sweet Mother Tour. It's an annual global conference for artists, entrepreneurs, technologists, public health educators, and activists. That's not the solution. The solution is to stop presenting things that reflect what we want to say. The underlying premise of the work that we do at SMT is that no society can develop without an understanding of its own worth. We believe that the arts, popular culture, can be a tool for teaching people the value in their own culture and in bringing them to the global table as peers and not as peons. It's an intense life for the Solfege crew who say their potential is limitless. Wow, what a great story, a great mission. I like that. Peers, not peons. Yes. Very deep. Very Thank deep. You. What's the latest uh, on Soulfish? What's been happening since the story came out? Well, it's funny. A lot of things have happened since the story came out. Um, a few months after that, or at least around the same time, I was recruited by a gentleman named Dave Stewart, uh, who's best known for his work uh, as half of the duo of the Eurythmics, mm -hmm. to Los Angeles. So I moved out to California, and the rest of the band located out there. Uh, we just got signed to a record label, and we are releasing a new record in the fall. Oh, wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Really cool. Now, when you were out in California, you uh, attended a, a rally and were interviewed by this reporter, and then this whole other thing blossomed. Tell us how that YouTube phenomenon got started. It's been quite a trip. I went to this Obama Clinton debate, and I, I wasn't even supposed to be there. A friend of mine invited me to go, and I was like, no, I want to go home and watch the debate where I can hear it because it's going to be a lot of noise. But I figured it's history in the making, so I went. And I was dressed very casually and hanging out with my friends with my cool sign. And this guy came up to me and he was asking these very, very aggressive questions. Now, mind you, we were interviewed by like two or three different people that day. Everyone's running around with cameras. But the nature of that interview 
wound up being quite interesting and it caught a lot of people's attention. Now you are an independent voter and you were going yes. to listen to both candidates. Why do you think that interview went the way it is? Because everybody's going to have to watch it, check it out themselves. But why do you think it went that way? I think that there's been a lot of dialogue about how, you know, Obama has gotten all of these young people involved in the campaign and that you know there's this question of does the senator have more than style is there substance there and are these kids drawn to just the flash do they really even know what's going on and i think that the video captured a lot of people's imagination because it pretty clearly illustrates that some of us very much do know what's going on despite the prevailing notions and i think that's part of the reason people have been spreading it and for those that have not seen it the reporter asked you a specific question about obama's health care plan versus clinton's health care plan yes. uh... and it seemed that he was expecting a, a non-answer from you but in fact you gave a very detailed answer yes mm -hmm. yeah and he was a little bit aggressive in his questioning but it was good because it gave me an opportunity to really talk about the issue and why i think it's a better plan and i feel like um, you know, maybe if more of our journalism was really getting into some of these background issues, it would be very helpful. And I also think that it's wonderful to have an opportunity as a young voter at a time when we're playing an unprecedented role in the campaign to get to speak to why we believe what we believe and to not be dismissed as simply being naive because we have hope that we could change our country. You would think that we would want a new generation to believe that they could change the country for the better. I think your experience on YouTube, your interview, kind of debunks the myth that young people are getting into this uh, uh, election just because of looks or because of the rock star status of Clinton or Obama, whichever side you're on. Yes, I think that's absolutely the case. I, at least I feel so. And I know so many of my peers, even before that video dropped, I sent an email to everyone I knew saying, hey, I've just contributed to a campaign for the first time in my life. This is why I think you should too. And I'm going to do the best I can to support my candidate. And I got all these responses back saying, yeah, we already contributed. That's a good thing that you're on board. <laughs> and so <laughs> it was so funny to see when this YouTube video debuted, all of these people I knew were already engaged. And that's mm -hmm. why I know for a fact that it's not just me who knows what's going on. A lot there of people lot engaged of people. in the process. Absolutely. Now, uh, I, there was an article in The Economist about uh, this video going viral. What did they say in The, in the Economist? Well, The Economist piece was really looking at uh, independence, the role of political independence in the campaign this year around. And they're basically stating that, you know, both Obama and McCain are dependent upon their ability to cross the aisle and that the independents may have an unprecedented amount of sway in this year's election and that you know a large number of the young voters see themselves as political independents mm -hmm. and I think that that's a really big deal and I think that the Democratic Party should be looking at why is it that so many of us are not willing to align with either party but are really trying to look at the candidate themselves mm. why do you think that is let's hear your opinion on it my opinion is that the parties have largely failed this I think that as far as like you know partisan politics I'm not concerned about whether this party stands for X or that party stands for Y. I want to know who is going to really advance the causes of the nation. Mm -hmm. And what typically happens is young voters are kind of marginalized. People figure they're not going to participate, so we don't need to speak to their needs. And so, therefore, we've never been invited to truly be a part of the system, and so we've grown up not being so. But the irony of that is that in this year, I believe we will play a pivotal role in deciding where the nation stands simply because we don't have pre-existing allegiances. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, an independent or a young person yourself, from your, like yourself might like a point A from the Republican agenda and point B from the Democratic agenda, but you're saying don't force us to go with one or the other? Exactly. I think that you should speak to us and you should convince us of why you have the best plan. And I think Senator Obama has done a brilliant uh, job of doing so. A lot of people talk about how, well, he's just got these great speeches, there are not a lot of details. If you look at the websites of these uh, different candidates, you'll find all the details you need. The thing is with Obama's campaign, there's an added element, which is he's invited other people to be a part of the process, mm -hmm. which makes us feel like, oh, wait a minute, you're not going to give me a solution to give me an opportunity to be a part be of the a solution, part of it. and that is profound. Well, it also illustrates again how much the internet is playing in uh, deciding uh, the candidates this, this exactly. go around. Okay, thank you very much, Derek. Thank you.